Um, this is an interview with Steve Fitzgerald on July 10th, 2008 at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta, Georgia about his involvement with the smallpox eradication program. The interview is being conducted as part of a reunion marking the 40th anniversary of the program in Asia and East Africa. The interviewer is Melissa McSwegan. With this interview, we are hoping to capture for future generations the memories of participants and their families involved in eradicating smallpox from Asia and East Africa. This is an incredibly important and historic achievement, and we want to hear about your experience. I have some questions to guide you, but please feel free to recount uh, any special stories or anecdotes that you might have um, th that you might remember about events or people. Uh, you will have the chance to edit the transcribed interview and add or delete information as you see fit before it is made public. Um, so at this point, if you could state your full name and that you know this interview is being recorded. I am Stephen Fitzgerald, and I do realize this interview is being recorded. Okay, great. All right, well, to start out, would you briefly describe your childhood and your pre-college education and how it w influenced you to go into public health? <laughs> That's a mouthful, isn't it? <laughs> well, I grew up the middle of seven in Minneapolis during the polio era of the 40s and early 50s. Um, at age 15, I contracted polio and was brought to the Sister Kenny Institute in Minneapolis, where I remained for about two weeks undergoing hot packs and exercise therapy for and they were torture. But uh, shortly after that, I broke my neck for the second time in a year and uh, wound up in a hospital and contracted um, echonine encephalitis. So my, teen, my early teenage years were not real fun. And I was exposed to a lot of people in medicine. And um, some really impressed me, some did not. I had no intention of ever going into public health. Although in college I did take a, uh, a course in public health that I found fascinating that's not what I in thought that I was suited to do. Instead, I studied to be a foreign service officer with a major and minor in political science, history, and economics and language. Uh, and while waiting for the foreign service entrance examination results, I needed a job. And I was looking specifically for overseas jobs. So I interviewed with a lot of international companies. And I happened to see a, an announcement on the bulletin board of the job center. And it said, Program Representative VD the hell is that? And it was U.S. Public Health Service, so I said, eh, why not? It's good practice. I signed up and had a nine o'clock appointment for the following morning. When I got there, the interviewer from CDC invited me into the room. I was his first interview for the day and already the ashtray was overflowing. This was February 1965. And in December of 1964, the Surgeon General's report on smoking 
had been published. And I said to him, after shaking his hand, what is the Surgeon General going to say about that? And he said, I could give a fat rat's ass. <laughs> and I said to myself, boy, I'm really going to enjoy this interview. <laughs> it was scheduled for about 25 minutes, and we wound up talking for over an hour and a half. And Within a week, oh, he gave me an employment form to fill out, all the federal forms. And within a week, I got a telephone call from him saying, where's your form? I haven't seen it yet. He said, oh, I, 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 I mailed it. And he said, yeah, right. Now get that form in here. Well, shortly thereafter, I got a call from Pete. And Pete was snowed in in St. Louis. And he said, I want to offer you a position. Where would you like to go? Sh New York, Chicago, St. Louis, or Los Angeles? And I says, yeah, by golly. This Minnesota boy hates the snow. <laughs> you got to get me the hell out of here. He said, that's what I thought, Los Angeles. And that's how my public health career started. About two months later, I was notified that I had passed the Foreign Service entrance exam. And if I would like to come to Washington, they would like to have me. But I was having so much fun doing what I was doing. Uh, out in the field investigating, interviewing patients, following people, sex partners. Uh, it required a, a lot of thinking on your feet and exercising your own judgment, nobody looking over your shoulder. Uh, this is too much fun. I, I'm going to stick with this. Particularly when there was held out the possibility that someday I might go overseas. Well, it was 10 years later that I did get that opportunity. And was assigned to India and the state of Bihar. Bihar is about the size of the state of Georgia with 80 million people. So it's pretty much wall to wall humanity. Uh, I was replacing one uh, of the medical officers, that was an American, uh, of the three teams that were in Sasaram district, this little district in Bihar. And one of the, uh, well, only one had, a, had an international uh, on the team. The other two were uh, led by Indian, young Indian physicians, uh, Harsh Wardam and I don't remember Dr. Prasad's first name, but they're highly competent young men. And Within two weeks, two and a half weeks, the WHO regional epidemiologist, Dr. Mukopat, came by and said, I want you to be the WHO representative in the state of Orissa. Orissa has about 45 million people. It's the first state below West Bengal on the Bay of Bengal. It's littoral and mountainous. And I thought, well, sure, wherever I can be the most used. And got into the whole process of, of public health in a, in a 
in a different way. Everything I had learned and used in the syphilis control program and gonorrhea control and so on was absolutely applicable because we look at person, place, time, opportunity. The who, what, where, when, why, and how of epidemiology. The mission of public health is early detection, intervention, and prevention of disease transmission, disability, and death. Perfectly applicable to any disease situation. And I loved it. Absolutely loved it. Being the, only, being the state uh, level team leader, uh, it was my responsibility to go around to all of the 15 different uh, districts in the country, counties essentially, in, in ERISA, the state of ERISA, and to check on how well the search for smallpox had been conducted. They were conducted once every two months in that area. And what it required me to do was to go into a village at random, a, a number of villages at random, and to search the village for the mark of the smallpox searcher, which was a chalk mark on the lintel over the door, to then inquire when they had last seen the searcher and whether he had showed them the picture of smallpox and knew about the reward. Well, since many of these villages were quite dispersed, it was only possible to do a one or two, maybe three villages in a day. Uh, but I discovered that there was a better way of doing this. I r realized that I wasn't utilizing all of the resources that I could. And the greatest single resources were the little kids. The little kids that tell you everything you want to know. So I instructed my driver to drive into the center of the village, and I would sit in this Land Rover uh, and read a book until the children were stacked up maybe 10 deep around the vehicle. Very polite. All they did was stay, sit and look. Many of them had never seen a white man before. And when they were sufficiently deep, I'd reach out quickly out of the window and slap the side of the vehicle and go, Rawr! <laughs> Children would scream and fall back. Then I'd jump out of the vehicle and say, Saya Adalamaum, which means, I am a tiger. <laughs> and they would scream again. And then I'd say, Bishram, Bishram, Mudavaku Kaivi which means, be calm, it's all right, it's okay. All I want to do is eat you. And the children would scream. Well, then I'd start up the side street looking for the lintel, and these children are following 10 to 15, 20 feet behind. And I would, of course, turn and growl at them to keep them interested. I would make a short circuit back to the village square and every single adult and every child who was in the village was gathered, were gathered in the middle of the village, in the village center, where I could go through the process of when, did you la when was the search last done here? When did you last see the searcher? How many cases of fever, show me where the cases of fever and rash are. Have you seen the photo? Do you know about the reward? Well, I could do 10, as many as 10 villages a day this way. 
Uh, and I had gone on a 15 day trip during the monsoon season. We had to make a 150 mile detour to cross a river because the bridge was out and the total distance between where I was and that place across the river was only half a mile. But we had to go 150 miles up to get over there. I also ran afoul of the, of the law on that trip. We had to take two canoes and have them lashed together and put the Land Rover on and get across the river. And as we were crossing, bodies were floating by and we got to the other bank and a diagonal because of the current and started to pull our way back up and I noticed that dogs had pulled a little girl out of the water and were feasting on her. Uh, and at the ferry landing about 200 feet beyond there were people looking every which way but over at these feasting dogs. Well, I told my driver to get the jerry can and we poured five gallons of gasoline on her and cremated her. And then went in to the district commissioner about four miles away to report what I had done. And uh, he was to say the least, a bit upset because I had destroyed evidence. They would have, they would of course, have done an investigation. And I said, nonsense. There were 20 bodies floated by. I don't see, didn't see a single police officer until I got here. You would have done nothing. Well, he said, well, you could be arrested for that. And I said, go ahead. Arrest me. And he looked out and he saw WHO on the vehicle. And he thought, well, maybe that's not such a good idea. And my uh, paramedical assistant told me when we left, he said, he wasn't angry at you because you destroyed evidence. He was angry at you because you didn't know if she was Muslim or Hindu. And anyone who enters the river, who dies, whose body is in the river, has offended the gods. And you cremated this young child. And she was not deserving of cremation. I thought, you know, there are some folk ways and mores that I don't think I'll ever get used to. But if I have the opportunity, I'll do it again. And he said, good. He was a very interesting character. He had been married 23 years and was childless. He and his wife were childless, which is a real tragedy in India. One night, during a terrible rainstorm, he had been going back to the uh, capital of Bhubaneswar and stopped at a medical clinic where the clinic staff were about to strangle a newborn because the woman was not married. And he asked if he could have the child. He took the child home and presented it to his wife as their first son. That son brought him luck in that he and his wife had three more children. At the time that he was my assistant, his son was graduating from medical school from the University of Edinburgh in Scotland. 
So what come, goes around comes around. His good deed, service to others. Uh, I got back to Bhubaneswar and after this 15-day ordeal and I bumped into another regional epidemiologist, Dr. Sigmund, whom I had never met. And so I went up to introduce myself. And I said, I'm Steve Fitzgerald. Uh, he says, oh, I know exactly who you are. I didn't go into a single damn village in any one of those provinces where the kids didn't run up and say, where's the tiger man? Where's the tiger man? <laughs> so he said, he, he realized that the villages had all been searched. And he said, I couldn't find a village you hadn't been in. So you hit on a new way, a better way of involving the population in this process and using them as a resource to find disease. Um, Orissa is a wonderful uh, state of this littoral and then mountain re region where I fa saw my first true wild tigers and elephants and I'd seen the damage they can do when they ran through a village and ravished uh, the farm plots. Uh, I saw packs of, of uh, hyenas and um, rhino. It was extremely interesting. We were driving up one of these mountain roads and it was switchbacks uh, and hairpin turns. and We came around one and there was this loud thump on the side of the vehicle. Uh, oh my God, what did we hit? And jumped out to face a troop of baboons. And the baboons, there had been a, tr uh, a, pa a troop of uh, elephants that had passed by about a half an hour before us. And the baboons were picking up the elephant dung and throwing it at the vehicles that went by. And I thought, just like kids, <laughs> just like kids, they just can't resist that ripe tomato in a passing car. Fun place. Uh, saw some very, very interesting things. From India, I went back to my assignment. I went to, was, actually, when I returned to the United States, I had found that I had been transferred from Alabama, or from Arizona to California to Sacramento. And it was about three years later that um, I wound up in Somalia for the East African uh, eradication effort. I was stationed in a place called Hudur, which is in the south. Well, because of the way Somalia is, is uh, kind of situated, it's a long, narrow country. It reminds me a lot of the reverse of California. Um, and was on the Ethiopian border. In fact, I went to a little town called Dolo, uh, which straddled the border. Half was in Ethiopia and half was in Somalia. Unfortunately, it was during the time of a war between Ethiopia and Somalia. And it was quite exciting to be sitting in a health center when MiG jets fly over and rocket the town and decided it was probably a good idea to leave. So went back up north of Hudur, 
northwest of Hudur to search for cases of fever with rash in that area. Again, we were on the border and, you know, I didn't think much of it until all of a sudden we were confronted with an, an armed soldier with an AK-47 pointed at our windshield. Exciting. Now, I had driven, well, shortly after I arrived in Mogadishu, uh, I was on one week of orientation in that area with uh, Alan Schnur, another uh, WHO person whom I was relieving. And by the time we started back, there had been an attempted coup of, against Siad Barre. And so the roadblocks went from 4 to 24 in the 120 miles that uh, was between my, where I was stationed in Mogadishu. And tensions were really quite high. Um, so when I returned to Hudur and was up on this area and we were stopped by this soldier, uh, at every roadblock you're asked to carry somebody. Somebody comes along who wants to get a ride in. And several times they had on trench coats and were carrying weapons and I said, no, absolutely not. If you want to leave your weapon here, I'll be more than happy to give you a ride, but I will not have a weapon in this vehicle. And that worked very well. That uh, probably was a, the very the safest thing I could have done. Well, another that this soldier who had stopped us said he wanted to get in the vehicle and drive us to the com uh, to the command center. And I said, no, you'll have to leave your weapon here. And then I'll be happy to go to the, up to where you want me to meet whomever. And he disappeared. About five minutes later, the whole side, the whole interior of the car got very dark. And I l turned to look at and could see nothing but this huge chest. And this guy, th this chest turned and a automatic rifle came up against the side of my head. And he opened the back door and climbed in behind me. He was the largest human being I have ever seen in my life whose biceps were twice the size of my thighs, I decided it would not be politic to argue. We pulled up to the their little command post, and this very proper, you know, properly dressed, maintained his uniform very nicely, young captain came up, he says, may I see your papers, please? Thought, Jesus. I handed them to him, and he said, well, I see, Mr. Fitzgerald, that your papers are indeed in order. However, you know, we are in a uh, unsettled area. Now, my soldiers would be severely punished for shooting you. But that would not put the bullet back in the barrel, now would it? I suggest to you, old boy, that you go back to your headquarters in Hudur and allow your Somali counterparts to, do, to do complete the search in this area. Well, I said, why, sir? 
You know, that's one of the nicest things that anybody has said to me in a long time. I do really appreciate your concern for my safety and welfare. And if you don't mind, I'll leave right now. We got about 50 yards down the road and ran out of gas. <laughs> and we got out, grabbed a jerry can, and were trying to fill the tank, hoping that those guys in the trees with machine guns were not going to pull the trigger. One of those instances where you say, you know, I guess God looks after fools and idiots um, because I survived it. And my love for Somalia, if you could call it that, uh, no, you couldn't call it love at all. In fact, I hated every minute I was there. There isn't a plant in that whole entire country that doesn't have thorns on it. <laughs> and you'd be driving along at 20 miles an hour with your elbow sticking out of, the, out of the window and get a thorn that long through your elbow and you know that that country does not like you. Uh, and then of course there were the instance of typhoid in Giardia that I happened to contract while there. The only foreign country in which I'd ever gotten sick. But uh, that experience, the, the experience of Somalia and, and sending teams into Ethiopia to check out rumors uh, did in fact show that there wasn't any more smallpox around. Now in both India and Somalia, uh, I have seen false rumors. You know, we once in India, in Orissa, the regional epidemiologist that I mentioned earlier, on the basis of a description called containment. Now, containment consisted of an absolute quarantine around the compound where the case occurred. Uh, vaccination of every human being within one mile radius within 24 hours, and then expanding out to three miles in 48 and 72. I had, I was not one day back from that 15-day trek when this occurred, and it was in the city of, it was outside of the city of Puri. We went and we looked at the woman, and I said, I said, why did you call this? He said, well, it was. It sounded like hemorrhagic smallpox, and if she was surviving, she would have been the very first person in, in history to have survived hemorrhagic smallpox. They bleed through the skin in every orifice. And I said, no possible way that this is smallpox. And he said, well, we'll find out. So we took some samples that I brought back to Delhi, and what had happened with this woman she had taken a home remedy from one of the medicine men in the area for malaria. And the analysis of this concoction was about 20% arsenic and had bled, had gotten very ill. But it certainly wasn't smallpox because she was up and walking around and had no fever, and that just does not happen. There were other cases of rash that looked like smallpox, 
lesions on the palms of the hands and the soles of the feet, a pustular rash on the arms and trunk. And I looked at her and said, Ask her husband when, how long ago it was that he had that sore on his penis. And he was quite surprised and said, five weeks ago. That woman had secondary syphilis. And there my training before <laughs> came into uh, play and did not result in this huge uh, mobilizing of resources to do containment, which takes an awful lot of people, an awful lot of time, and an awful lot of effort to do. And we confirmed that, in fact, it was a case of syphilis. So those are the kind of curious things you bump into uh, as a result of some of the things that go on with smallpox, the rashes, uh, how, how the rash appears, how it goes through stages. It's very, very similar in many ways to the way the syphilis occurs. But again, it is a, that early detection that is so important. My strongest belief was in surveillance. The stronger a surveillance system is, the sooner you're going to detect disease. The sooner you can do something about it, and the sooner you can prevent other cases from being transmitted. And surveillance is an absolute drudge activity. And so often it is people will come to rely on a passive reporting system where they wait behind their de desk for case reports to come in. And in my estimation, that is only one leg of a tripod. There has to be active surveillance as well, and active surveillance is going out, not only looking at those people who are reporting, but those who aren't, and stimulating them to report, to be aware of, to raise their index of suspicion for disease. The more they're looking for it, the more they're going to see, and the more they'll report. And then public information getting the public involved and aware of what is going on. Just like those little kids in the village. If you can get people involved in it, uh, your chances of success are far greater. I used to do a lot of program evaluations. And sometime in the 70s, people started to dress down when they'd go out in the field. You know, they stopped wearing sport coats and, and shirts and ties and started wearing jeans and sweatshirts. And I tell them, you know, if you're worried about your safety, you're far better off to wear a shirt and tie or a sport coat because you can never sneak in to a neighborhood. I don't care whether it's Harlem or Crown Heights or Underwood in, in Chicago or any area of Baltimore. You cannot sneak into a neighborhood. So go there with your badge on your lapel. Say health department. You no longer are perceived as a narc or an undercover police officer or an insurance investigator, or DEA. So if they, oh, he's only health department, you're an awful lot safer. Nobody's going to shoot you. 
when you go to do an investigation, you don't just pull up to the person's door. You drive around the block first to see if there's, who's on the corners. Are the kids out playing? You don't see any kids out playing, don't stop. Because there's going to be a shooting. If you don't see the drug do dealers out on the corners, don't stop. Come back at a different time. It's dangerous. Always point in the point your car in the direction of your escape route. You don't want to have to do a U-turn while somebody's shooting at you. <laughs> Simple little things about how to stay safe, how to how to do disease control smart. What would you say, you've talked quite a bit about some of the challenges that you face. You've talked about guns and you've talked about the, mm -hmm. the environment, physical environment, and you've talked about some of the cultural challenges. What would you say would be the most rewarding experience you had um, during your time with the smallpox campaign? The sense of accomplishment. A job well done. That this area had no smallpox. Not on my watch. From Somalia, I went to the to East Africa or to West Africa for a yellow fever outbreak, the largest in fifty years. And the little country uh, in West Africa called the Gambia. And we managed to vaccinate 591,000 people in 30 days. We st I took 26 jet injector guns that were left over from the swine flu program. We started at both ends of the country and came to the middle. And then I stayed on to build a seven antigen childhood immunization program measles, mumps, uh, no, diphtheria, pertussis, tetanus, measles, polio, yellow fever, and uh, BCG. When I arrived, they had an infant uh, mortality rate of three out of every five children. Three out of every five under age five died. When I left there was less than one out of five died. There was no polio, no measles, no yellow fever, and we had the highest immunization rate in the developing world. We had higher immunization coverage than they had in Great Britain. And it continued that way after I left. Uh, that was a great accomplishment. The payoff was that when there was a coup there, just before I was about to leave, both the rebels and the paramilitary came by my compound and told my wife that she needn't. She and the Pickens need not worry, because everybody knew the doctor. No one would come into her compound, and we received not one single bullet strike uh, on our bill, uh, on a, of our house, on our house, and every other compound in the American community did, and. That says, the people know you, they trust you, they like you. And when I left, the director general uh, gave me the keys to the country, and he said, you have broken every folkway, every moray, every custom in our country, but not once did you do it with malice. You did it out of stupidity. <laughs> And it was that old saying, ascribe not to malice that which can be adequately explained by stupidity. 
And that's me. <laughs> Go in, blunder around, and try and get the job done. People will see that that you're sincere and that what you're trying to do is not to hurt but to help. No one initially wanted to work on my teams, my uh, expanded program on immunization team, because we worked too hard. We worked too long hours. And we went out to the field and rousted people out of their health centers and said, no, nah, we're going to go out to the people. We're going out to the villages. We're going to trek. And this we did. And they grumbled and hated it. Oh, man, they disliked it and disliked me intensely. Until about two months later, three months later, when Ramadan started. And just before the Feast of Eid al-Fitr, uh, every team member was presented with a goat or a sheep. Not only did they see that they could buy their, their goods uh, you know, and produce fresh and cheaper by trekking, but they were looked upon with respect for the first time. The people were amazed that we were coming to them to immunize their children rather than having to carry a child 10 or 15 kilometers to a health center. Another thing we found is that you never turn a mom with a sick child away. And the thinking at the time was you could not give a child two live virus vaccines at the same time. You had to space them. Uh, and I, this is nuts. Uh, unless that, and you never give an immunization to a child with a, who's sick, who's ill. I said, this is nuts. You can't turn that mom back. She just walked 12 miles with that kid on her back. Unless they're dying, immunize them. And I thought, well, what a wonderful way of using the kids. Now, kids, those infants and youngsters need to be immunized. Now, who carries them to the health centers or to the villages, or to the centers where we can set up an immunization clinic. It's the moms. And what are we working with here? A country that's 98% Muslim. And what about the women? The women are not allowed outside of their compound without the husband's consent. Well, except to get the kids immunized, which all the men were in favor of now. More kids living means more kids for their Social Security in their old age. And children are indeed their Social Security network. I decided to set up a clinic around a market day at the same time that people come to buy goods, we'll have an immunization clinic. And as it turned out, many women, because they were bringing their children for immunization, got to see their brothers and sisters that they hadn't seen since they were married, hadn't seen in five or ten years. And so it got to the point where moms, after the complete immunization schedule had been given to the child, moms were tearing up the road to health card so they could continue to come and get their children immunized and visit with family members that they wouldn't normally see. So it's one hand scratching, you know, the back while the other one scratches the nose, I guess. Uh, it's getting the best, getting
getting the moms committed to this process and rewarding them with an opportunity to see family members they wouldn't normally get an opportunity to see. So it was a win-win situation. And whenever you can get a win-win, that's what really counts. And How would you say that this experience with the smallpox campaign has impacted your career since then? Officially? Either officially or unofficially. Either way. Officially, probably was neutral. Okay. Personally and professionally for for me, mm -hmm. oh, it was an absolutely wonderful, broadening experience. Uh, gave me a true appreciation of what we have. And gave me a, a wonderful appreciation of how they do so much with so little. When I was first went to India uh, in 75, if I threw a tin can away and threw it out on the trash heap, it was not there in the morning. And when I would go into the, the town of Sasaram, it was very likely that that tin can was turned into a lantern. I didn't believe it. So I marked several cans and did indeed find them in the marketplace. Hmm. And they recycled everything. Now I see that with affluence, They're becoming like us. Mm -hmm. And in some ways that's very sad. Uh, but they did so much with so little. And it was just awe-inspiring to me. It taught me that, hey, you can't complain and uh, you can't complain about what little you have you know, compared to what others have. You've got everything you need. Uh, it's when you don't have something that you need that you're in trouble. I've got everything I need. And the older I get, the more I realize how little that is. Uh, don't need much. Want a lot, but don't <laughs> need much. Well, is there anything else you'd like to add about your experience with the, small fo the smallpox campaign? It was a wonderful, exciting time. Uh, it was a test of endurance. It truly was. Uh, it's, it was physically hard, mentally hard, emotionally hard. I remember seeing some some very bizarre things. In Somalia, we ran across uh, Mahawat. Uh, that's not, I don't think that's the right term. He was a, uh, a member of one of our teams who was a uh, he had a golden voice and sung for all the Muslim religious ceremonies and, and prayer services that they would hold. It wasn't an imam, but there was a gathering of several nomadic uh, bands that came together for this religious uh, celebration. And we thought, what a wonderful opportunity to check for smallpox came upon them and as we walked into the group there were I noticed two children buried in cow dung with just their faces out of this dung 
and asked my counterpart, what's going on? He said, I don't know, but we'll find out. The children were, were apparently very ill, had high fever, and they were drugged and then buried in this dung to bake in the sun for three hours. Well, we hung around long enough to see them dig the kids out and wash them off. No fever. These kids weren't sick anymore. And I took pictures. And they were reluctant at first. And I said, there are many, many different ways, some probably better than Western medicine, for the ills you have. You know, you've got survival tools that date back 10,000 years. I have survival tools that can only, that, that have only been around for the last 20 or 50 years. You know, who says that mine is better than yours? You know, we're just we're just two different knowledge bases. And the trick is to build the bridge between them. How do we do that? Not that I have the answer, but have an answer. And you've got probably four or five answers. Uh, finding out which works best. It's like that article I'm sure Dr. Foster has made you read. Miriam Weir's article on the banana theory, uh, the banana leaf theory of uh, immunization. Look it up. It's good. <laughs> well, thank you very much for your time. You're I very welcome. I appreciate the stories you've shared, and, and um, I'm sure that others will too as they watch the video back. So, thank you. You're welcome.